Hey, praise the Lord, everybody. Good morning. How about that worship this morning? Is your soul lifted? Is your heart lifted? Are your prayers lifted? Is your praise lifted? Our God is an awesome God. He deserves our praise. Hey, it's good to be with you this morning. I'm grateful to share the word of the Lord. Have I told you how much I love you? Have I told you how grateful I am to be your pastor? Have I told you how grateful I am that God lets me learn from him and share with you what he's taught me? Hey, this morning, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in a number of scriptures, kind of like a Bible study. Uh, might be a little preaching here and there. All depends on how God speaks and how God moves. I want to preach this morning. We are still in the Bodybuilders series. We're still in the Bodybuilders series. I've discovered, and I discovered this some time ago, that marriage is placed in Scripture in the context of spiritual warfare. One of the most essential passages about marriage is found in Ephesians chapter 5, and Paul places marriage between the bookends of spiritual warfare. He opens Ephesians talking about the heavenly realms and where our blessings come from, and he begins to pray for the Ephesians that they would know the power of God. They would know uh, his power to resurrect from the dead. And he talks about Jesus being above all rule and authority and power. He's talking about demonic forces. At the end of the book of Ephesians, Paul reminds the Christians, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that our struggle, our struggle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the uh, the wicked forces of evil in high places. And Paul says that we're to put on the spiritual armor between Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 6. Paul places in here a discussion about marriage. In the book of Genesis, Adam is alone after um, God has created uh, man. And no, long, no later, or rather no sooner than God um, could, could get Adam set up in his place of employment and put him to sleep for a wife, the devil comes in to destroy the marriage. I'm simply trying to tell you that marriage, your marriage, exists in the context and between the bookends of spiritual battle, spiritual warfare. I want to teach this morning, I want to preach this morning from the subject. Your marriage is in a minefield. That's a revelation for somebody. You had no idea that the reason all hell breaks out in your marriage, the reason uh, the devil keeps trying to destroy your marriage, as a matter of fact, the reason the devil came for your marriage and destroyed the marriage that you had was because your marriage was placed in the midst of a spiritual minefield. The devil hates marriage because the devil hates God. Let me say that one more time so somebody can get it. The devil hates marriage because the devil hates God. Anything God makes to bless you, anything God makes to promote his kingdom, the devil will come against it to destroy it. You didn't even know it. I wish I told you a long time ago that when you thought about getting married, the devil would come against you, that he would try to destroy you. But God has given marriage, listen to me, as one of the principal ways that he builds and expands his kingdom so that as people have children, whether they have children literally, physically, or they influence others through their marriage, that the Lord expands his kingdom and the devil hates marriage. And so he has come against the institution of marriage. I'm going to get real old-fashioned on some of y'all real fast. God has, he designed marriage, he planned marriage, he intended marriage to bless you. Listen to me real close. You can love whoever you want, but you cannot call love, love that God doesn't call love. Let me say that one more time. I went way too fast. You can love whoever you want, but you cannot call love, love that God doesn't call love. Marriage has never been God's plan between two men or two women. 
I ain't scared of nobody. I got the help of God on my side. Some of y'all have gotten, you, you've gotten, um, you've been, <laughs> I don't even know what to call it. But God calls marriage very clearly the relationship between a man and a woman. One man and one woman. Not one man and three women. Who am I preaching to today? I'm like, Pastor, where are you going with this? I simply want you to understand that it is the devil's will to cause confusion in marriage, about marriage, through marriage. Listen, the devil wants to tear down your children by tearing down your marriage. He knows that if he can disrupt your marriage, destroy your marriage, he can sow a seed in your children that says, oh, I ain't never going to do that. Why would I ever do that? I'm not, I'm not fitting to get locked down, tied up, tangled up in nobody's love. I'm going to just be single and mingle to the rapture. And I'm trying to tell you that it is the devil's desire to destroy the natural inclination uh, within society and human relationships for marriage. I know everybody's not planning to get married. God has room. He has made, listen, that is, that is God's desire that there's some people who are going to flow better without a, a spouse. Without a spouse, <laughs> that, let, let me not get into that. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. If you're not planning to get married and you don't believe marriage is for you, don't be trying to have the blessings of marriage. I, I feel the Holy Ghost right there. Who am I preaching to right now? If you don't want to be married, don't plan to get married, ain't got no interest in marriage, don't be trying to do what God has designed for married people. I believe that God wants to bless your marriage. That's why I'm, having, that's why I'm sharing this message. I believe he wants you to experience the joy of marriage. I, my prayer is that God would redeem marriages that are on the rocks, that he would awaken people who have who have been, uh, had their minds deceived and clouded to think that they cannot have a blessed marriage. Listen, my wife and I, Sherry, we've celebrated, we just celebrated 30 years of marriage. We love marriage. We love being married to one another. We love supporting marriages. We love encouraging people to hang in there and fight for their marriage. Don't give the devil a foothold in your, don't give it to him. Don't let him have a single inch in your marriage because God gave you your spouse to bless you. All right, let's get into this. I want to share four principles today about how you can navigate through the minefield and come out whole on the other side because God wants to see you blessed by marriage. I'm going to share four principles, a number of scriptures. Here's the first one. You got to learn how to accept one another. You got to learn how to accept one another, accept who God made as your spouse. Accept yourself, yes, but accept your spouse. Come with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Some of y'all know this passage. When God woke Adam up and gave Eve to him. Genesis 2, verse 18. The Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. Adam got through naming all of the creatures. And when he got to the end of it, he's like, whoa, Lord, something, something is missing. Something, this is cool. This is good. But something ain't right right here. And the Bible says, but Adam uh, for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place, that place with flesh. The Bible says the Lord God took from his side a rib and fashioned out of it uh, Eve, his wife. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. And when God awakened Adam, when God woke him up, <laughs> I want you to see the brilliance of a man who was submitted to God. That's going to help somebody. I know he was submitted because he was dead asleep. That means God put him to sleep. He lay asleep. And when God awakened him and presented a wife to him, look at what Adam said in verse 23. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man, for she was taken out of man. Adam, listen, 
Adam woke up and said, OMG, my God, look at what you have done for me. Look at how you have blessed me. Look at what you have given me. Adam didn't wake up complaining, well, why, why is she five foot three? And why does she weigh so much and so forth? Come on and help me preach somebody. And why couldn't you make her hair a little bit longer? And why couldn't she look like Susie? I feel the Holy Spirit right there. And why couldn't she look like Shaquita? Come on and help me talk right now. Adam didn't say she looked like my old, she, she don't look like my old girlfriend. Adam said, Lord, you have blessed me, thank you for the woman you have given me. This is now bone of my bone and flesh. Of my. He took, listen now, he took her as his own, as a gift for him, as someone from God. And here's what I'm trying to tell married people today. You got to learn how to accept your spouse for who God has made them, not for who you think they are supposed to be. I feel the Holy Spirit right there. I'm not talking about accepting sin. I'm not, I'm not talking about accepting foolishness. I'm not talking about accepting things that are outside of God's will. I'm simply saying stop trying to change your spouse to be who you had in your imagination. When you married them, after one week of getting to know them. <laughs> See, I'm like, Pastor, can you stop meddling? Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Everybody, everybody... <laughs> Everybody evolves and everybody unveils. Here's, my Lord, who, who is that for? You can't know all of who your spouse is or was designed to be until you have been with her or him long enough to see. Stop tripping when you discover new things that you didn't expect. You're going to get more than, you, more than you bargained for, I promise you. And your spouse is going to get more than they bargained for. Who am I preaching to? right now. It's not like they got you and got everything that they were supposed to get. Somebody shout, stop trying to change your spouse. Accept them. That's such a powerful notion to accept the person that God has given you. Did you know psychology today says that when people live with a constant thread and threat of rejection in their marriages, it it has the power to send them into deep depressions. I talked to somebody recently, and she said, I'm tired of feeling, um, how does she say, I'm, I'm tired of feeling rejected. I'm tired of feeling like I'm a nobody. I'm tired of being made to feel small. I'm tired of being made to feel like, I, I, like they're the only one who brings something to the table. Can I just talk to y'all for a minute? You're not the only one who brought something to the table of your marriage. If you can see your spouse for who God made them to be, you'll realize that they brought something and you brought something. If we can just come together and accept one another, my Lord, what, what the Lord would be able to do in your life. The devil wants you to reject your spouse. And rather than appreciate them and embrace them for who they are, to begin to sow seeds of division and discord in your marriage because you keep treating your spouse like they're not enough, like they're not good enough, they're not something enough. Now, you following what I'm saying to you? Is this making sense? God gave Adam almost everything he needed in the garden, the only thing he didn't have was the wife that he needed. Listen, here's, here's, here's how you accept your spouse. You got to come into agreement with God. You got to come into agreement. God, thank you. God, you did this. This was your doing. Now, listen, you were in love when you met in the club. You believe God was bringing you together. You beat down the doors of a preacher, some preacher, I don't know who it was, to marry us. We got to be there. Listen, if God was in it then, God can be in it now. Can you accept one another? Can, should I get to my next point? Let me get to my next point. <laughs> Here's a second point I think is really important. You got to learn how to celebrate one another. Listen, even a broke clock is right twice a day. You, you got to find something to celebrate in your spouse, about your spouse, because everybody needs to feel celebrated. Everybody needs to feel like they bring something to the table that's valuable, that's special, that contributes to the climate of our marriage so that we can, we can have something special, build something special, be something special, and be a force 
for God. Celebrate one another. I want you to come with me to the book of the Song of Songs. Some people call it the Song of Solomon. Right after Proverbs, right after Ecclesiastes. By the way, that, that idea of to celebrate means to rejoice over or to praise. To rejoice over or to praise. How about that? It means to have a good time. Celebrations keep the spark of life going for us. Celebration is, is crucial. My wife had to teach me how to celebrate my birthday because I was like, I don't, I, don't, I don't celebrate nothing. But I realized that God has, he's built into us a rhythm of celebrations. That's why in the Jewish calendar, there's so many celebrations throughout the year. God wants you to celebrate your spouse and celebrate one another and with one another in your marriage. Look at this couple in the Song of Solomon. I'm just reading a few verses from, from chapter 4. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. I love this. I love this scripture. You got to read your Bible. My God. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Some of y'all are like, Pastor, what, what, is, what is all that? Look, just go with this. I'm, I want you to see. This man is celebrating his woman, and he's talking about her beauty. When was the last time, husband, you told your wife how beautiful she was? Ah. Oh, that show looks nice on you. Oh, I like how you did your hair this time. Oh, let me see your nails, girl. Oh, I like your nails. Oh, I love, you know, you know that does something to me. Let me let me calm down, y'all. Some of y'all are like, pastor. That's too much. I'm, 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 I'm not even married yet. Work with me. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming up from the washing. Oh, I love the. He's, he's like, I love the gleam on your teeth. I love when you smile. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Thank the Lord. Your lips are like, the, like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. He's talking about the dimensions of her face and how beautiful she is to him. Your neck is like the Tower of David built with curves of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. He's talking about a, she's got a picture of strength and dignity. And he's like, I love that about you. He, I love that you're, you're, not, a, you're not a wimpy, whiny, um, you're not, you don't see yourself as a victim, but you come with dignity, you come with strength. And he said, I like that about you. What do you like about your spouse? What, what, do you, what turns you on about them? What do they do that makes you celebrate them? What is it about them? Verse 5, your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Till the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. He's like, um, I want to make love to you, girl, all night long, all night long. L listen, as soon as I get off of work, 5 o'clock, let's have dinner, get the children to bed. My God, I can't get home soon enough. When I think about all of your curves, y'all not going to help me preach in here. <laughs> Is this too much for you? Listen, when John Legend sings it, all of me loves all of you. <laughs> John said, listen, you got to celebrate who you got. And later on, she celebrates him. She talks about him with words of celebration and acceptance about what he is and what he brings. Listen, the devil doesn't want you celebrate. Listen, the more you celebrate something, the better it gets. I feel the Holy Spirit right there. The more you celebrate things that your spouse is and, and that they do, the more attention they will give to it. If you give negative attention to areas of your spouse's life, guess what will happen? They will magnify in their mind and in yours. But if you begin to give positive, celebrative um, attention to the dimensions of their person and, and their spirit and their positive attributes, guess what will happen? those dimensions will begin to grow because they'll begin to take more, give more attention rather to them. Am I making sense to you? He says, accept one another, celebrate one another. Let me give you one or two more of these. Submit to one another. Oh, it's about to get deep right now. 
The devil doesn't want you accepting each other. He doesn't want you celebrating each other. He doesn't even want you living in a posture of submission toward one another. Come with me back to the book of Ephesians chapter 21. Usually when we read this passage about marriage in the book of Ephesians, we skip over this verse. I don't know why we skip over this verse. Actually, I do know why we skip over this verse. Ephesians 5, 21. Mm. Paul says, wives, actually he doesn't say wives first, in verse 21 he says submit, there it is, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Right after that he will say, wives, um, uh, submit yourselves to your own husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. In verse 25, he will go on to say, husbands, love your wives. But before he gets into her submission and into his love, he begins with their submission to one another. He's talking about the body of Christ, which, be, which, which includes the marriage relationship. Stay with me. This is going to make sense in a moment. Paul says that one of the ways we defeat the devil in our marriages, the way that we beat the devil out, the way that we build up our marriages. Listen, one of the more taxing things on a church is when marriages are struggling and failing. We're here to support marriages. We're here to encourage marriages. We provide counseling uh, we, we point to a counseling network. We do marriage classes. And I'm telling you, it makes a difference if you take advantage of it. Paul gives this principle. He says, submit to one another. This, this is a powerful Greek word. It means to come under array. It is to arrange yourself under. It's a battle term. And it was a, the, the idea of what, what soldiers were to do under the authority of their leader, their, their general. They would array themselves in submission under that leader, listen, so that they could fight a common enemy and have the best chance to win. The same principle is applied to marriage, and God says to the husband and to the wife, if you can just submit yourselves one to another, if you can come under God's authority and array yourselves under God and submit to one another. Listen, sometimes, husband, your wife is right. Sometimes, wife, your husband is right. Nobody knows everything. Here's what I learned about marriage. Can I tell y'all one of the best lessons I've ever learned in marriage? One of the best lessons I've ever learned in marriage. One of the best, the best ever, all time. Here it is, it ain't deep, it ain't theological. It ain't terribly spiritual, it's just good. Listen to your wife. I feel God right there. <laughs> he said, what do you mean by that, Pastor? I believe God gives wives insight while he often gives husbands foresight. My job is to forecast where we're going and what it's going to take. But my wife has a brilliant sense of insight about what's good and, what's, uh, and what could be effective. You, are you following what I'm saying? My wife's got a, I think she got a sixth sense when it comes to people. She'll say to me, um, you, 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 you might want to watch over there. First time she said that to me, I said, oh, you tripping. I don't know what you're talking about. You, 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 you just, you know, you, you get too worked up. They're, they're, they're good people. That's a nice person. He, he all right, he all right. He means well. About two and a half months later, I said, baby, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I had to say those, those famous last two words, three words. How I many is it? Three words. You were right. Here's what I'm trying to get you to see. Had I been submitted to her and given credence to the weight of her gifts and her insights, had I treated her as my equal and said that her voice matters and she has something to say, she's got wisdom to offer and submitted myself, I would have saved myself the heartache that came two and a half months later. And Paul says, submit yourselves one to another. Is this helping anybody besides me? When no one is willing to submit in a marriage, 
we got trouble. Because to not submit means that we're always asserting ourselves, asserting our rights. And why won't, you, why won't you do what I want you to do? And why won't you do what I want you to do? Here's what I'm trying to get you to see. Everybody has something that they bring to the table. And your spouse is given to you by God to be a help to you. Uh, Peter says it this way. He says, husbands... Uh, be considerate towards your wives as the weaker vessel, he says, and to treat them with honor. And then he'll go on to say, because don't even pray if you don't treat them that way, because your, your prayers won't even be heard. God has given wives a weight of honor. He's given husbands a role of leadership. Am I making sense here? And what I'm simply trying to say is both of us have, <laughs> excuse me, both of us have something that we bring to the table. And there are times when I got to submit to my wife and there are times when she's got to submit to me and we choose to act in submission to one another and we humble ourselves toward one another and recognize that she brings something and recognize that I bring something and we walk together. And it's been an amazing 30 years. What God has done for us he is able to do for you. Somebody shout, submit to one another. Let me give you this last one. I think this is probably one of the most important ones as we, as we wrap it up. And that is we have to learn to forgive one another. You have to forgive one another. The devil loves it. Listen, he, he loves when there's disarray and chaos. One of the reasons there's so much chaos in the home, I'll go back to submit, is because there's no order of submission. And the kids don't know, the kids keep trying to manipulate one person or the other because they know that somebody's not going to submit and they can get whatever they want. But he also hates that there could be forgiveness in your home. Listen, as long as there's two people in one pod, somebody's going to get their feelings hurt. As long as there's two people, somebody's going to offend the other and do something that the other didn't like. I'm not talking about permission to be abusive or to be hurtful. I'm just simply saying, you got to know, not, listen, don't take offense. To take offense means to absorb offense and to hold it against a person and to pull back and to withdraw. God says that we are called to forgive one another. Come with me real quick to Luke 17, 1 through 6. Trying to get your marriage out of the minefield. Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. Jesus says, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It'd be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. If they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. This is some hard stuff. Let me tell you what will lock up your marriage and give the devil room to have a field day in your home. When your spouse comes and they repent and they say, I'm so sorry, I know that I was wrong, let me make this right with you. That's what real repentance is. Real repentance is not when they go, well, why, when are you going to get over? Why, why are you making such a, that, nah, 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 nah. But when they come humbly and admit they're wrong, how long are you going to hold it against them? How, how long is it going to be until you stop bringing it up? Because some of us bring stuff up that happened 20 years ago. I feel the Holy Spirit right there. And you're trying to figure out why we can't move forward. Here's why. is because things that don't resolve, they devolve. I'll say that to you one more time. Conflicts that don't resolve because we've forgiven each other, because we've said, I'm sorry, because we've said, listen, I, let's move forward. They just keep revolving. And here's the thing. They revolve and devolve. They get worse over time because they haven't been resolved. Key here is forgiveness. The Bible says that offenses are unavoidable. He says, but listen, 
when you've been offended, you have, to, you have to go and tell your spouse, this is what you did that hurt. This is what you did. You can't go off to a room and sulk and, and go out and party with, you know, your, your homies or your girlfriends and be like, do you know what happened? Listen, you ain't got to go all out. You need to go, you need to go and tell your spouse, when you did this, this is what it, how it impacted me. And if they have the humility to say, I'm really sorry, forgive them. Because when you forgive, it, it, listen, it silences the talk and the voice of the devil in your home and in your marriage. Listen, I said this to you, and, I'll, and I want to re repeat this. Your marriage is in the middle of a spiritual minefield, and the devil is trying to blow things up every turn. And he wants to get you, if he can keep you from forgiving one another, if he can keep you from uh, uh, um, submitting to one another, if he can keep you from celebrating one another, if he can keep you from, um, <laughs> forgive my first principle, y'all know what I'm talking about, if he, can, if he can keep you from one anothering one another, accepting one another, if he can keep you from that, he believes he can have a field day, but I believe God has more for your marriage. And that's why he gave the Lord Jesus. He says that marriage is a picture of Christ's love for the church. Marriage is God's thing. It's just, it's, God designed it to bless you. And when you put Christ at the center of your marriage, and this is my appeal to you, I wouldn't go another day without making Christ the Lord of my life. I wouldn't go another day in my marriage without saying, Lord Jesus, you take the head, the, the, listen, the head of our dinner table belongs to you. Lord, you can, you can have every room in the house. You can, listen, come and take your place and be the center of our marriage because we got children to build up. We got work to do. You Listen, God brought you together so you can do something bigger together than you could ever do apart from each other. But Christ has to be at the center. And my very strong appeal is that if you haven't received Christ, you'll do it right now. You, just a simple prayer, right where you are. Don't move, don't move, don't move. Stay right there. God is talking to you. Lord, come into my life. God, come into my life. If you're with your spouse, grab your spouse by the hand and say, Lord, come into our lives. Be the Lord of our home, the Lord of our marriage. Lord, Lord over everything that we have and we are, we want the, we want the victory that you can give us in our marriage, in our home, for our destiny, for the future of our children, for generations to come. We believe it begins with you, and we say yes to you. If you as a couple have gotten away from the Lord in your life, I want you to come back. Let's come back to church with us October the 3rd. You can come back in person, or if you're somewhere else in the country, just tune in, stay here. We want to help you strengthen your marriage. God loves you, and he has a plan for you, and it begins again, with you making Christ the center of everything you do. And my prayer is that this message has given you insight and perspective about why the fussing and the fighting might be going on so much and what God has in store for you. You can defeat the devil if you submit your life to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for showing this, showing us that marriage is in the middle of a minefield. But thank you that through Christ we have the victory. Through him we have the victory. He has defeated Satan. Help us to walk hand in hand with Jesus so that the devil can't win in our marriage, in our home, in our family. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you receive Christ, if you need a church home, would you just, just say so in the comments? And somebody on our team wants to connect with you, help you grow forward. Hey, I love you. I'm so glad you were here today. I can't wait to see you Tuesday for our Dig Bible study.